Hello and welcome to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Friends. I am your host, Leon Wolf, and we are delighted that you have decided to join us. Today is Thursday, November the 19th of 2015, and I want to start off the show, as I always do, by introducing my regular panel of co-hosts. First of all, I'd like to introduce F. Bill McMorris of the Washington Free Beacon. Needs no introduction to all of you. And also Jeff Blair of the Ace of Spades Decision Desk. Glad to have him here with us, as always. We also have with us, subbing in for Neil Doing, Sarah Gonzalez of Red State. Sarah, glad to have you here. And as our guest for tonight, we have Kira Davis joining us. And Kira, we are glad that you have decided to be with us since she is from Every Joe. We're going to run with a diminished panel with only four folks tonight. I think it probably works a little better in terms of capturing the dynamic, making our producer Aaron's life a little easier as well. So we're going to talk for most of the night about the terror attacks that happened in France over last week and really continuing on throughout the course of this week. Last Friday night was kind of the focal point of the attacks. We had a number of gunfire attacks, grenade attacks, of course a, a, a very harrowing hostage situation in which dozens of people were killed and French authorities were forced to essentially storm a crowded theater to, to attempt to rescue some of the hostages who were there. Um, it, if you've watched the news at all, you know that it's kind of a continuing, ongoing situation there. The French police have mounted a number of highly armed raids uh, there in Paris of strongholds. They believe that they've killed Abba Oud, the mastermind of Friday's attacks, uh, but they still don't know how many more active cells might be in and around the Paris area still kind of plotting attacks and how many more we might expect to see. So I guess I'm going to go, first of all, to Kira with the first question of the night, as we typically do to our guests. Kira, what's your sense of this? I mean, is, is this all over? I mean, do you get the sense from watching the news that the French police have this under control, or <laughs> do you feel like it's going to be going on for, you know, another couple of weeks that we're going to continue to have these midnight raids with all this gunfire and explosions in Paris? I think it's just beginning, to be honest with you. I think that we're going to see an escalation uh, that might turn into what we will officially call a world war. I actually am seeing all signs pointing to that. And one of the things that uh, I find concerning is that not only are we talking about asking France to deal with terrorism, so that's how desperate the situation has become, that we're asking the French to step up, which they're doing a little too late, but they're doing, um, but at the same time, we're watching these Syrian refugees be caught, quote, refugees be caught at the border, you know, with mysterious passports. We're seeing um, increased levels of security. Belgium is on high alert. Germany is rooting out their cells. We have let this problem go on for so long. These people are just lying in wait all over the world. I really do think that we're in for another huge disaster. I really do truly believe that is coming. I pray to God it's not on our soil, not to wish bad on anyone else. But I'm an American, so of course I would hope, you know, my country is a little more safe. But I do think we're going to see an escalation in things, and we will either be forced to seriously prosecute this war, or we're, we're going to have to wait until we can get rid of... Um, mom jeans in chief and get a real leader in there who can maybe take the lead on getting rid of some of this vermin. Sarah, we're going to go to you next. And I guess, you know, we don't mean to be crass, but this is a political show here. I mean, what's your sense of how all of this is going to play out with the U.S. political electorate? I mean, this this is, it's dominating pretty much everyone's news. I mean, CNN pretty much has everyone on site. Anderson Cooper, Aaron Burnett, I mean, they're all over in France reporting live. What's your sense of how, if at all, this, this can affect the United States elections that we're going into here in 2016? Well, I mean, I think it can only be better um, for the Republicans. Um, just, I mean, you see over in France, um, this is kind of shifting even more so to um, the Republican Party, and you're seeing a shift there, um, you know, where they are leaning towards them even more just because they see what's going on and they see how, um, you know, they're handling it and they want to change. So I think that that's going to trickle over to the U.S. as well and um, we're going to kind of see a swing of people who are going to realize that um, they're going to need someone who's going to take uh, terrorism seriously and they don't have that right now. So, so Bill, let's, let's go over to you. And one of the things that has, has kind of come out of all of this is that France basically responded by immediately sending 
uh, you know, planes over to bomb ISIS locations in Syria. And of course, <laughs> the problem with that is that we already have a situation in Syria right now where we're very close to having the United States and Russia in a direct shooting war with one another. How how can the this kind of backlash intervention of the French, what, what kind of possible complications do you see that this might play in terms of how things are going in Syria right now? Well, when you look at France's participation in the, uh, the air campaign thus far, I think what we're going to see is a similar situation to what we had in Libya. And if you look at our air campaign, it has not been very effective thus far. The Russian air campaign has been totally ineffective if your goal is to fight ISIS compared, or uh, it's been very effective in Russia's goal of keeping Assad in power at all times. So I think that France's participation here can only be a good thing. When it comes to what we saw play out in Libya, though, is you saw France, Great Britain taking the lead, and within weeks they basically ran out of missiles. And the U.S., which was you know so fond of saying, hey, we're leading from behind, ended up having to take the lead anyway. So although they're, they have very good national resolve right now, and they say they're committed to this air campaign, it wouldn't surprise me if this led to increased pressure on the United States to step up. France will go, hey, I didn't get my 75% uh, tax increase, my 75% tax rate, so I can't afford you know, my 80% uh, of my GDP going to my social services and this air campaign. We've spent all our money. We've used all our missiles. Can the U.S. take over? So if anything, I think this leads to uh, increased pressure on Barack Obama to basically take charge of the air campaign. So that's what I see as the most likely scenario. Now, maybe France really does. Maybe this changes everything. And France does take a leadership role here that will at least spare Obama the inconvenience in his own eyes of really committing here. Uh, but it could lead to one, uh, the Libya situation, which I described, or it could lead to the sense of, you know, even with France, even with Russia, and even with the United States bombing, it could finally convince some policymakers that, hey, troops on the ground, be it in, through special forces or extensive um, logistics troops on the ground, helping uh, and directly steering local forces, um, that's, it could show us how ineffective air campaigns are here and force us to actually engage on the ground. That's more long-term, though. So, so, Jeff, let me go to you. And I know that you're reasonably well-tuned in to, uh, you know, European politics. And, you know, if, if we look at the way that things are playing out in, in France, before any of this happened, Hollande was, was polling in third. His party was polling already in third. His approval ratings this year got down to, like, 13%, like a, a shockingly... Low record number. lows, record lows for the modern era in France. in France. Right, and so he 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 was he was in deep shit before any of this happened, and in fact, uh, you know, the French didn't, don't have their presidential elections again until 2017. But I mean, if they had been held today, it would basically be a two-way election between Sarkozy and Le Pen for first and second place in France, uh, with Le Pen actually leading in the polls right now. And, and I guess if, if you look at what's happening across Europe, with the kind of notable exception of Greece. A lot of these, like National Front in France and, and the Polish, the PIS, there are a lot of far-right parties who, who are not like far-right in the way that we think about it. I mean, they're not economically kind of mainstream Republican. They're not even that far-right on those issues, but they are extraordinarily like, Donald Trump plus levels of xenophobic. Yeah, just to, to briefly explicate, uh, they are kind of a Europe. It's called European nationalism. European conservatism is is fundamentally different from American conservatism in that it is built on what the term in German is gluten boden, blood and soil. All right, it, it's built on ethnic identity, which is something that's really, I mean, outside, as you said, of sort of Donald Trump. And all of the sort of white genocide, white loving people who follow him on Twitter, it is not really something that's noticeably American. It's a very European ethnocentric concept. And you see it in France, you see it in Poland, you see it even in Germany. It's only in France that I think it's a real threat to actually take over the government. And I still don't think it will. The way runoffs in, in French government work is that like... Yeah, you assume that liberals will vote for Sarkozy. They're, 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 and, and, and it's already happened once before when Le Pen actually placed, I think, in the runoff between... Uh, I can't even remember who it was. Uh, it was the previous... Uh, before Sarkozy. And 
and what happened is that everybody just said, you know what, we don't like you know that guy, but we're going to vote for him over, over Le Pen. So that that's what will happen in France, you think. But you know, a few more of these attacks and a few more senses that the French don't really even have this problem as much as the Germans. The Germans are the ones who are in real trouble. Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel has sort of cultivated a reputation in, in Germany as being untouchable. Simply, it's impossible to think of replacing her and the, and the Christian Democratic Party there. Um, once her sense of inevitability becomes punctured, I am very, very concerned about the kinds of people who could take over. You could have either a far left or a far right party do it. She is sort of that centrist party. God only knows what comes after that. If there is any kind of terror attack that matches what we saw in Paris, that happens in Berlin or Munich or Frankfurt or God only knows where in Germany, that government could be seriously threatened. And if Germany's government is in turmoil, the entire European Union project suddenly becomes in turmoil. And that is something that, honestly, like I'm not a big fan of the EU, but that should scare us because Vladimir Putin over, you know, you got to think about all these irons in the fire. What is Vladimir Putin and Russia's long-term goal? Their long-term unstoppable, inexorable goal is to destroy the European Union and the American EU bond. As much as we don't like the EU in certain political or ideological senses, it's kind of a better option than some sort of post-EU fractured order. I've been writing about this red state all week, and, and you know we've probably lost you know half our viewership talking about this. But I think that Jeff. Damn is, it, Leon! I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, and I think that it's I think it's important because I think that I, I like you have the sense that what happened in France last week might be the first domino that causes the entire EU system to fall. I think that France closing their borders might result in the end of the Schengen zone, which is for those who who are not familiar with Europe. You can, it is a zone that's part of the EU that you can, without having your passport checked, um, basically travel throughout 28 countries in Europe, basically, again, free. Your passport doesn't get stamped. There's no record of where you go. Um, and I, I think that what we're seeing is that France, if they move out of that, which I think is one of the concessions Hollande is going to have to make just to stay basically in power, um, the zone itself is is over, and I think that we're going to see some some of the economic fracturing that's that's happening in the EU as well. And I'm going to go back over to Kira here. Um, and and I guess my question is, I mean, is is there a chance that 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 ISIS has has essentially bit off more than they can chew in ways that they don't understand with what they've done here in France? I mean, it, look, it's one thing for them to 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 attack us. I mean, we're Americans, and, and Europeans, I guess, have a have a different sense. But I mean. I, I've been watching the news for the last four days pretty much constantly, and you know, even the man on the street interviews that Anderson Cooper, who's you know obviously not a you know rah rah warmongering guy, is having with French people on the street. I mean, they sound like George W. Bush voters in America right now. I mean, what are the chances what... that some of these far right people that you know take power in Europe that uh, that things turn around on ISIS in a way that they're not prepared for right now? Well, Leon, that's what happens when your direct way of life is attacked. That's what happened to us after 9-11. All of us got together, rah, 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 we're not going to put up with this. We're Americans. This was an attack on freedom and our culture. And now look where we are in, you know, a mere 14, 15 years later. While you and I can still smell the burning embers of the World Trade Center, we're arguing about what we should do about terrorists, you know. So clearly there's a disconnect between the horror of the event and the distance that time puts between you and that event. And I think, that I honestly, I, I do believe that the French people are angry right now. I don't trust that, it, that that anger will last. But I will say that I don't, I, though, is ISIS, has ISIS bit off more than it can chew? I don't know. I do know that our very own president, who happens to be the leader of the free world, thinks that this is the JV team, and they're already killing free citizens in the West. So have they bitten off more than we can chew? It doesn't matter. What matters is that they're evil dickheads, and they need to die, and we should kill them all and bury them with covered in pig's blood. And leave one guy and let him go run and tell everybody else that this is what happens to you when you kill innocent people. The problem with this whole conversation, I said this in another interview yesterday, is that we in the West 
like to think of these people as reasonable. We don't understand why this situation can't be reasoned with. There's got to be a reason why they feel this way. There's got to be a reason why they would kill themselves and so many other people. There is no reason sometimes. I know it's frustrating. I know it's wrong. I know that you can't understand it. But ISIS is the Kardashians of terrorism. There's no reason for them. They're just evil. So speaking of Kardashians, let's go to Sarah. And one of the things that was the most kind of disturbing to me about this, this entire scenario, because we, we like in the West to think to ourselves, my gosh, well, here are these crazy nut jobs, but probably the vast majority of people over in the Middle East are okay, uh, is you had this soccer match that took place in Turkey a couple of days ago, and I don't know how many of you saw this on the news, but they asked the people who were present at this soccer match – about 80,000 people there in the stands. They said, we would like to hold a moment of silence for the victims of the Paris terror attacks. And so the players all lined up and bowed their heads, as you would expect, and sure enough, immediately from the stands come chants of, you know, Allahu Akbar and martyrs never die. I mean, what's the scope of the problem that we're facing here? I mean, if this is kind of the, the popular reaction in Turkey, I mean, is... I mean, to what extent can we essentially reason with any portion of the population over there without just committing ourselves to total war against an entire region of the world? Um, I mean, I don't. We're not going to. We're not going to reason with them. They're either going to believe what they believe, or they're not. And I really think that any kind of, you know, trying to reason or rationalize with them is just going to make them even more averse to anything that we have to say because then it's going to be like, well, these Americans are just trying to tell us, you know, what to do and how to feel. Um, so, I mean, I, it, I mean, how do you how do you reason with this kind of thought process? You know, I mean, you you just can't. So, I I really like Kira's answer. <laughs> the detailed, elaborate way of dealing with it because, I mean, reason's not just going to cut it as much as, you know, liberals want to say any kind of, um, you know, retaliation is just going to make them even more mad. Well, I mean, okay, so we just sit here? No. I mean, it's, w there's nothing that, I, I honestly really don't think that there's any kind of way that we reason with them. I really don't. Bill, one of the things that's been floated um, relatively regularly over the last couple of days in the press is the idea, and, and this has to be coming from somewhere probably within the State Department, of a possible alliance, and I'm going to use the words the scare quotes here uh, intentionally, alliance between the Russians and the United States to go fight ISIS. And anyone with even a passing understanding of the Russian mindset knows that it wouldn't be an actual alliance because we don't share common goals with Russia where ISIS is concerned. But what are the chances that the crack diplomatic team we have now led by Kerry gets duped into what they think is an alliance, which at the end of the day, Russia says, when it comes time to actually boot Assad out of power, says, oh, our bad, we're not going to participate in that part, you guys have good luck with that. Gosh, I just have this image in my head of of Vlad Putin riding a horse and and shirtless, of course, and John Kerry on the back of the horse, like a motorcycle, with just his arms wrapped around him, just riding into Syria, you know, big scimitar in Putin's hand, and like a kite, and John Kerry is just floating behind him, and that's the way I'm pretty sure. Vlad Putin sees this working out as well. Is, uh, is, in terms of, does, does Vlad Putin end up having sex with John Kerry on the back of that bike? No, no. Not with that, Theresa Hines that, Kerry. That's, that, that's, the, that's the saddest part about it is John Kerry is going to get you know his hopes up and everything like that, and it's just going to break his heart. And John Kerry will remember, like, at the end it will be too late, and John Kerry will go, oh, no, I read that romance novel in Nantucket last year. How could I not see this play coming? <laughs> that's, that's my response. Thanks, Bill. I think Kira has something actual that she'd like to say in response have, to the question. I have a real thing that I want to say with words that come out of my mouth. But one thing is that the thing we have to remember, was it two years, three years ago, that little... Uh, exchange between him and the Russian president 
you tell Putin after the election, I'll have a lot more flexibility. And remember how people freaked out over that? And on the left, people were like, it's not a big deal. He's just saying X, Y, Z. And on the right, people were like, oh, my God, don't you see? Here's the flexibility, folks. The flexibility really meant that Obama was going to be flexible enough to bend over and grab his ankles while Russia banged us in the ass. And this is what is going to happen if we align ourselves with Russian interests. Can we use them to get what we want done? Absolutely. We've done it in the past. We could do it before. But Obama's not smart enough of a leader to, to lead us there. We need to get rid of that guy, get somebody else in with some real conservative bona fides and some real, you know, somebody who doesn't wear mom jeans and wear a bicycle helmet. I mean, please tell me how embarrassing that is. The the problem is the the decisions are going to be made here in the next year in terms of what we're going to do. And and I think the problem is where I see this sticking is that we're going to say, all right, Russia, we're going to, we're gonna we're gonna come we're gonna ally with you, but at the end of the day, you guys are gonna get on board with Assad being kicked out of power, right? And Putin's yeah. gonna be like, yeah, man, sure, rock on. And then at the end of the day, you know, we get you know we we take control of ISIS territory. He is not. He's gonna back out and say, all right, what are you gonna do about it, John Kerry? And That's the how answer I feel. is gonna That's be nothing. That's how I feel. I'm sorry, Red State viewers, that I had to be so graphic, but. You get the I mean, picture now, right? I'm sorry, that's how I feel. That's exactly what's going to happen. He's going to have to bend over and grab his ankles the way we've been doing for the last seven years. I, I mean, if you, look, if you look at the sad part about this, and uh, is that best-case scenario this works out like World War II. Russia had very, very um, different goals than we did going into that war. And, and yeah, uh, we were able to, to come together only after Russia... Um, you know, got uh, got invaded by the Germans and the alliance was broken there. But the difference now is, and at the end of the day, it took it took it took Alger it, it took Alger the yes. of the world to communist y- Yes, yes, but that was because a, a top member of the president's team was a fucking spy, uh, the guy who helped basically seed over Poland and East no, Germany. No, liberals to this day don't believe that. No, the, the the kid. No, that's not true. That's not true. Most of them, the, they stopped talking about Alger Hiss because they recognized that it was true after the. You Benoit walk on any university but, campus in America and ask uh, any history professor if Alger Hiss was a communist spy, and he will argue it to your face. Anyway. You, no. Anyway. Anyway. What's sad about this is they don't even need a guy on the inside anymore. We'll just take it because it's good politics. Because hey, you know, at least we have another country check that we can see responsibility to. And th- that's what I see. Uh, that's what I see coming out of this whole, you know, it reminds me of G- when G.I. Joe teamed up with Cobra to fight the war on drugs. And then, like, the next episode, Cobra was back committing terrorist acts. And that's pretty much what Putin's going to do to us. <laughs> Jeff, let's go to episode. you. We haven't heard from you in a little while. I think obviously we're probably we're in a situation right now where as long as President Mom Jeans is in power, we're not going to have boots on the ground. I, I want you to, you know, use your future telling glasses here and give me give me a percent chance you think that by the year 2018 we have United States boots back on the ground in the Middle East. What do you think? I mean, uh, especially if there's a Republican president that takes power. Um, you know, given what we know just of what's happened in France, we assume this continues. What do you think the chances are we get boots back on the ground in the Middle East by 2000? Well, the answer, uh, quite simply, is uh, dependent upon the immediate uh, threat to any particular ally of the United States is in the region. Sadly enough, that doesn't mean Israel, um, because, well, first of all, there's always a per- kind of perpetual threat to Israel. And uh, more importantly, um, they can defend themselves. So if Jordan or Saudi Arabia or uh, any of our real allies in Egypt, for another matter, are really threatened by ISIS in the near future, we'll put boots on the ground. Now, how many boots on the ground are we going to put, and how openly will we acknowledge that level of engagement? But that's an open question. I actually predict that it'll be little. Particularly, if this all has to happen before Obama leaves office, it will happen. People will force it within the administration to make it happen. All right? They will ba- basically put Obama against the wall and say, listen, you son of a bitch, this needs to happen, and it will happen. 
Okay, so the only question is how much publicity will it get? Under a Republican president, it will probably get more open acknowledgement for the simple reason that Republican voters want to see that happen. Democratic voters don't. Um, I am not entirely convinced that a full boots on the ground uh, operation is necessary to destroy ISIS. I think that you need to have some people on the ground, but I don't think you need to send in as many people as we did for Iraq, for example. I think if you want to have some... Worth, is it worth the cost, do you think, Jeff, and it would be significant, would it be worth the cost to deny ISIS a physical territory to operate out of, such as they have now? Absolutely would be, but here's the issue about that, okay? Everything that... When we talk about denying ISIS a physical territory, what we are actually talking about in the real world is a permanent occupation force. What kind of appetite do you think the American people have at this point? Not me or you or anybody on this panel, but if we are actually polling the masses, and the masses may have their heads up their asses, but they are the masses, what appetite do you think the masses have for a permanent or semi-permanent occupation force in the Middle East? Because believe me, if the minute you withdraw one, some sort of ISIS analog will come flooding in, because that is the effing nature of the game with radical Islam. I'm sorry, it's it's like a tar baby to use that you know old analogy. You've gotten yourself stuck in this, you can't pull back. So the minute any US force goes in, they're gonna have to be there for the long run. Do, do, do we think America has the appetite for that? I wish we did. We certainly seemed to have bunts upon a time long ago. But and I don't I, know if I we do now. And I think that it's probably going to be a... I think that the chances of that happening got significantly more likely just based upon what happened last weekend. And I, and I think that if you look at... I think that America has to come to view ISIS as the same kind of existential threat as they did, you know, Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia in post-World War II. I mean, we just recently closed, you know, the last of our Air Force bases in, you know, Germany. And I, and I think that if... You know, that has to be the kind of perspective that we have, and I think that America probably comes closer to it every time one of these stories uh, comes into play. And, and, and I'm probably going to – I'm going to monologue here just a little bit, and, and I have to disagree, I, I guess, a little bit with what's been said. I, I do think that there comes a point that ISIS has, has really bitten off more than they can probably chew, or more than they think – um, that they're dealing with here. And, and listen, this is the reality. And, and I know that I'm probably going to be labeled, you know, backwards and bigoted for, 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 for saying this, but the, the people in this part of the world, the, their mindset and, quite frankly, their religion is just not compatible with the Enlightenment. It's not. I mean, it's been shown. And here's, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Even the kind of more modern Middle Eastern countries the ones that have gotten wealthy due to oil, don't know how to drill the oil out of their own damn territory. This is an absolute fact. This is something that we in the West have known how to do, do for over 200 years. So when it, comes, when it comes to pass that Iran and Iraq and all these places had massive amounts of oil, they did not even know how, even at this late date, to go and get it. And so they are still to this day paying American and British companies to go and pull the oil out of the ground for them because they still don't know how. Even the communist dictatorships in Central America, who essentially invited the same companies in, figured out within five or ten years just by watching, oh, this is how this is done, and eventually seized all of those production plants and said they're now the property of our state. The, the, the Middle East countries still haven't figured out how to do that. And, and I think that at the end of the day, they're going to find out that picking a fight uh, with folks who know how to do things like innovate military technology is going to be bad news for them. And sooner or later, the giant is going to be awakened, uh, and they're going to have more of a fight on their hands than they really know what to do with. Um, I want to go, and, and let's talk a little bit more about the refugee issue, and I want to go back to Kira here on this one. So we've talked a little bit about Alans, and he's, he's done a lot of the things that, that I would like to, to see a, a leader of France do. And he's, he's obviously being pressured, I think, by Le Pen and Sarkozy in terms of a lot of what he's done, but he's closed the borders, he's, he's made all the right noises. But one of the things that he is doing is he's continuing essentially to allow another 30,000 of these 
Syrian refugees to enter the country. What do you think of uh, Olan's decision to, to, to do that at this time? I mean, it's like it's like taking a nail and pounding another hole into the boat that's already sinking. I understand the reflex. I truly, truly do. Because listen, well, a lot of the Red State viewers might not know, know me very well, know this about me, but I was a liberal, like, default Democrat my whole life. My parents are atheists. I grew up in Canada under socialism and socialized medicine. That was what I believed, and I understand this concept of socialism, and I understand why people believe in it, because I used to believe in it. And truly, it is this desire to do good. Not knowing what good is and not knowing really the mechanisms of good, but wanting to feel good in your heart and to let people know that you're a good person. And that's what Alain and the left in France are doing. And even here in America, this whole argument we're having about the refugees. And I have to say, Leon, that I, as a Christian, I am conflicted. You know, I know that um, what Jesus commands me to do is to love my neighbor as myself. But at what point? Does your actual neighbor, does that apply to your actual neighbor? At what point does your actual neighbor deserve your love and your attention and your protection and your charity and your help as opposed to people that are, to are, half, that are halfway across the world? So I think in those terms, we have to look at it. This is not a black and white issue. This is an issue of... Um, how do we show kindness to our own neighbors as well as those who don't live on our shores? Uh, I'm sorry that Europe is going through this. They're reaping what they, they, they're sowing what they've, I've had too much scotch. Which is it? Reaping what they've sown or sowing what they've reaped? Somebody tell me. You have, you have, you have sown the berry and now you shall reap the whirlwind. <laughs> My very salient and intelligent and sober point is that it's not an issue of caring. Of course, everybody cares. We get it. It's an issue of, of how you protect your people and what you've sworn to do. And it's not responsible of Alain to be letting this happen in France. And it certainly isn't responsible of us when we have experienced one of the most horrific terrorist attacks in modern memory and we have known that these people come to our shores and take advantage of our constitution and take advantage of our tolerant society and use that as a weapon against us. And we should know better. And the time is for compassion, but when do we have compassion on our own neighbors that actually live here? And, and this, is, this is what pisses me off about this. And I wrote about this today, and I may have gone a little over the top with this, but it... Obama and the de Blasio and the other liberals who are saying that we should continue to let the refugees in with basically no additional checks, we shouldn't even pause, are, are lecturing all the rest of us as though America just rose up, you know, and got out of bed this morning and decided to be, you know, racist against the Syrians or bigoted against the Syrians. And what they ignore is if you look at the polling that was conducted in August and September when this issue first came up, a vast majority of Americans favored allowing the Syrians to come here. Um, so it's, I think that Kira is right. I think that we have a natural instinct as Americans to want to help the refugees. And I think that people initially when this story came out said, yeah, man, you know, let's, let's let the refugees come here. They didn't respond to this just out of, you know, we hate Syrians and so we're not going to let them in our country. It's response to actual events that occurred. I mean, the more we watch the news, the more we come to understand how deeply ISIS infiltrated this this flood of, of Syrian refugees, quote-unquote, and used it to their advantage. I mean, it wasn't just the people who planned the attacks in Paris. It's, it's we found, uh, you know, numerous people who were flagged on the watch list. We found that, that folks in, in, in Turkey for basically $5 or even for nothing are allowing people from Syria who are on watch list to just cross the border uh, completely without checks and without no record that they've ever even been into Syria. And we have no idea where the hell those people are. And we find out just yesterday that there are the folks in Honduras who almost made it to the United States with fake Syrian passports. So it's not that Americans are, are stupid and bigoted and just hate Syrians. It's response to actual news and events that happened. And it's, it's frustrating to me that they're treating this as, oh, you cowardly bastards, you know, just, just cold-hearted idiots have no idea what's going on and you just hate Syrians. No, it's, it's response to actual items in the news 
that ISIS has infiltrated the flood of Syrian refugees, and we want to make sure, because we don't trust Obama, we have reason to not trust Obama based on what he said, oh, we had this problem contained, everything is fine, everything he said about this has been wrong to this point, why would we trust him to be the guy who screens the refugees? Sarah, let's go to you next. Right now, um, the, the Senate Democrats are stuck essentially between a rock and a hard place. The rock being the fact that only 25 to 28 percent of Americans want the Syrian refugees to continue coming here without further checks, and the hard place being their habitual uh, beaten dog-like tendency to do whatever Obama wants them to do. So I guess the question is that with the House having passed a resolution that basically pauses the Syrian refugee program, is... Uh, Will there be six Democrats who flip in the Senate to actually make Obama veto this bill? Or do you think that they, uh, you know, just, just like the dog here in the bell ring, just vote for whatever it wants and, and filibuster it, prevent it from ever getting to his desk? Um, you know, I think that they're actually going to listen to their constituents on this one. Um, I think that they're... I mean, I, maybe I'm just hopeful, I don't know, but I think that they are going to go against, you know, their leader. Um, they've kind of been a little more outspoken lately since all this happened um, about, you know, what we need to do and just see, we've seen them breaking from Obama um, several times in the last couple weeks and I just, I, I want to believe that, you know, they see he's coming to the end of his term. Um, they're kind of losing their allegiance. Um, he's losing his luster, and um, I think that he's going to be forced to veto, which, of course, he will, um, because he really doesn't care what everyone else wants. But, um, I, I mean, I, I really think that he's, he's going to be forced to veto it, because I, I want to think that they're, they're finally over it, and um, I think they're going to vote for it. So, Bill, let's go to you. Why, does, why is Obama not following what the currently stated law is, which that he's, is that there's supposed to be a religious test for the Syrians who are coming here, that they're supposed to be Syrian Christians and not Syrian Muslims, and, and there's every indication that the administration, in the course of their vetting process, is completely ignoring that. Uh, what do you make of what's going on there? Well, what's actually very, uh, very interesting here is that uh, the U.S. law basically mandates that you put priority on people who are directly targeted and that's why the administration is considering a uh, a genocide classification for the Yazidi population in Iraq because they have been directly targeted by ISIS. Now what they have refused to do is include Christians in that entire designation. In fact they've flat out ignored it and Obama is actually now using that as a, as a dividing point to separate him from those hick Republicans who only like, you know, Christians that look nothing like them. Uh, so what's so interesting here is that uh, I have a story on the Free Beacon today. Out of the 350 people, the Syrians that we have admitted to the United States since October, so the past month and a half, there have been five Christians. Christians make up 10% of the Syrian population. ISIS has directly targeted their villages. ISIS has branded Christian homes. That's that U symbol with the dot, that's N for Nazarene. Um, that has been appearing on Christian homes and Christian businesses all around Syria. They are directly targeting these people. They are beheading Christian children. They are crucifying Christians all over the world. And the State Department, when I reached out to them and said, hey, you know, over since January, Christians have represented less than 2%, 1.6% to be exact, of all of the people we have taken out of Syria. And Muslims represent 97% of the population. And they said, well, we've accepted 5% of all religious minorities there. The bulk of those are made up by uh, Shia Muslims uh, who, have, who have an easier time uh, converting than do the Sunni Muslims uh, that ISIS represents. So we're totally leaving these Christians to die because Obama wants to use this as a dividing point between him and Ted Cruz. And it, it defies logic, even though the State Department said, oh, this is just happenstance that their number, that they're so ill represented here. Um, it, it just defies logic. And a point, a missed opportunity, I think, for the Republicans here and a way that they could 
win the refugee argument outright without sacrificing uh, fears is to say, okay, you want to bring in 10,000 unscreened Syrians, and your entire plan, you say this is a dire situation, and yet one of your talking points is that it'll take 12 to 18 months to get these people here. That doesn't sound like an urgent response. It sounds like the stimulus where you're like, the country is going to collapse tomorrow, but we're not going to spend all the money for five years. Even putting that aside, all the Republicans had to do was say, you know what, we can bring 10,000 Syrians once we bring the 35,000 military translators that we left in Afghanistan and Iraq that are constantly threatened by ISIS, they're constantly threatened by Al-Qaeda, they're constantly threatened by Iranian-backed militias in Iraq, the people who served with us, the people who had to pass numerous security background checks, the people who have to pass numerous DHS background checks, now that they're in the visa popula uh, application pool, these people have been vetted. They're ready to bring the United States. They all have letters of recommendation from the Marines and the Army and the Special Forces guys that they served with, and we're leaving them to die, and we're taking a bunch of random unvetted people. All they had to say was, oh, you guys only want to take 10,000 people? We're going to save 35,000 people from certain death, and then s watch the smug drip from their faces. That's all the Republicans had to do. They chose not to, and it was a missed opportunity to bring back people who serve this country honorably. I do want to make one factual correction pointed out to, to me by uh, Grant, Grant Gambling on Twitter. Uh, my buddy Grant, and he is correct about this, Iran has nationalized their oil production. They are, as far as I know, the only country in the Middle East that currently has. And definitely the territory that ISIS controls now is... Again, it's still it's Exxon, it's BP over there pulling the oil out. ISIS does not even have the technical know-how at this point um, to assume control of already operating oil fields, much less grow for new oil. So let's go to Jeff. Well, that's actually not true, though. You do go ahead. ISIS is actually making really good money selling Syria's oil back to it. They, no, they just they just they just flat out they've just flat out stolen the money that's there. They're not actually selling the they're not getting the oil for themselves. They've basically just stolen the oil production and saying we're assuming control of this. And the companies like BP and Shell and whoever else that's over there basically go along with whatever kleptocrat government is there in power allows them to drill. They understand this is a cost of doing business. It's not that ISIS has any knowledge or ability. If, if Exxon and BP or whoever it is just packed up and left tomorrow, those oil fields would not be running two months from now. I mean, that's a, that's a guaranteed fact. ISIS just hasn't had the ability to do it. Well, of course, I grant you that. They do not have the technical know-how or expertise to extract oil from the ground. Right. But so what they're making the bank off of it. It's basically theft. And, and again... Uh, if you're somebody who works for VP or Exxon, you understand this is a con. You know the places where oil is found in the world generally tends to be places that are run by kleptocracies, and you build into your budget that a lot some some portion of your oil or its capacity is going to be stolen. I mean that's just you, you mean like Alaska? <laughs> well, yeah, that too, that too. But uh, um, in any event, let's move on to you, Jeff. What do you think the sure. long-term politics of this? Um, uh, of the refugee situation are going to be when they play out. I mean, we've got, you know, all the Republican governors and one Democrat have said, you know, don't put your refugees here. All the rest of the Democrat governors have said, that's fine, go ahead and bring them on. What do you, how do you think long term this, this situation is going to play out? Because right now America is very much on the side of don't let them come. But, you know, these things do have a tendency to change. So how, how do you think that the refugee situation is going to play out in the end? In the long run, we're all dead, which is just another way of saying in the long run, nobody ain't going to remember shit, and that's the truth of the matter. Because if you're asking if somebody is going to remember an issue that is current in November of 2015, come November 2016, you're asking a whole hell of a lot. The honest truth is the only way this will end up a truly vote-getting issue in a general election as opposed to a primary is, God forbid, if there is a terrorist attack. And that is, by the way, entirely possible. And, in my mind, not at all implausible. So that's exactly what I think is the, the, the only way that this can be sort of weaponized by one party or another. Um, I actually, you know, beyond that obvious observation, I just want to emphasize and sort of doubly agree with what Bill said. Um, Bill's point about how it is a moral abomination, a moral blight upon America's record that we have not gone 
out of our way and bent over backwards to expedite the visas and the transference of people in Iraq and in Afghanistan who assisted our soldiers as translators, as guides. Uh, I, I did literally, I read these stories, Bill has written a couple of them, and it is the kind of thing that actually just makes, gets my back up, it actually makes me angry. It is a moral crime, and I do not understand why it is the case, and I also do not understand why we are going out of our way to accept refugees from any other part of the country, any other part of the world, before we prioritize these people. Uh, I got nothing else to add. I just, I, I'm so upset about it that I felt like it needed to be repeated. Kira, let's go to you. We got to close out the show with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of 2016 talk. It is that time of the year. You know, this, this, um, this season is going to be a little different from last season. You know, the Iowa Coxes are about a month later than they were in 2012. 2012, they were uh, like the first weekend in January. It was, you know, January 3rd, if I recall. Yeah. This year, they're February the 1st. Um, how, does, how does that, if at all, affect kind of the Trump slash Carson phenomenon, the fact that it basically gives people another month to think about the, the, their choices before they have to actually cast the first votes in this contest? Well, I think it has an effect in the media, but it's not really going to have an effect with their ground games. And I do believe that uh, Trump, will, I, for all our frustrations, you know, I know my fellow pundits have been really having a hard time with his surge in the polls, and I know a lot of people like to make fun of him. I, I personally, uh, although I would loathe to see him as our president, I'm a big fan of Trump. And I love that he's in this race because he's brought attention to the Republican Party that they haven't had in years. And there are people that know Marco Rubio's name who have never spoken his name aloud ever except because he was on a stage with Donald Trump. So I like Donald Trump in that respect, but I do know that really most of what he says is BS. And the people that would support him and go door to door for him know that as well. He doesn't have a ground game. I know Carson's is weaker, but I think people underestimate uh, what's going to happen when the when it's time to get the boots on the ground. We might see a surprising surge from Carson. I do think we're going to see, um, as we get closer to that to the Iowa caucuses, that, that Trump's ground support will die off. But it does give them, an, uh, an, as you say, Jeff, another month to be in the headlines, to be in the spotlight. For Don... For, for, oh, God, you just called me Jeff. For, <laughs> I'm sorry. I called you Jeff. My deepest, <laughs> sincerest apologies. I blame the scotch and um, the a a a a a alcohol. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I think what we'll see is, for Carson, I don't think it matters. But for Donald, I do really think that having that extra month matters because I really do believe he's truly just campaigning for another reality show. So I think that extra month is going to be great for him. For Carson, I don't think it matters. You know, We'll see how that shakes out in the end. But Donald Trump is playing a very um, strategic and, in my mind, clever uh, publicity campaign for his next reality show. So, you know, more power to him. and I think that I think that's an interesting point. I mean, for for all and look, I, I have as much consternation about Trump as as literally anyone on the face of the earth. But you know what? He has brought some astounding ratings to Republican debates. Has gotten some exposure to Republican candidates that they would otherwise never have had. And for that, I suppose we should thank him in the end. But Sarah, let's go to you. And, you know, we, 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 we have been talking about some very serious news over the course of this particular, you know, podcast. And it, as the news gets more serious, I think, in my own good-hearted way, that the American people are going to look and say, my God, we don't want Donald Trump to be the guy who's making decisions when the terrorists are running rampant over Europe and Asia and here in America. That, that would be crazy. So on the other hand... I mean, there are a lot of people who seem to be comforted by the Donald's unique, uh, brash style and think, you know, my gosh, if anybody's going to go over there and get reckless with these terrorists and, and just drop bombs willy-nilly without concern about who he kills, it's going to be the Donald. So I guess, I mean, what would you predict if we continue to have this sort of news cycle about terrorism and about things that concern people in terms of where they live and their security? Is it going to cause 
Trump and Carson support to fade, or is it going to get um, you know bigger as time goes on? What would you think? Um, I think that that all depends on how hard they're hammered um, and what they're asked. Because I mean, if people ask the right questions, they're going to find out really quickly that these guys have no idea what they're doing when it comes to that. Um, and but it's I mean, disconcerting to me because that's already been exposed. I think in the in in the case of both candidates. I mean, literally Ben Carson in the last debate. I spent a considerable amount of time talking about China being involved in Syria. And anybody, they're not there. I mean, and that's not a tremendous amount of background news. It's just, you know, watching the news will tell you that. And it, it hasn't affected him at all. I mean, anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt. I, no, I mean, it's fine. I I just, I don't even know what to tell you there. It's this this phenomenon I just, I can't really wrap my head around. Um how people could be taking either of them seriously at this point, especially with, you know, all of the new, all the terrorism talk going on and everything like that. It's, I just, I don't get it. I mean, people, you know, they voted for Obama, so, you know, there are some people out there who don't really know what they're doing, but I, I don't even know what to tell you. It, it, it angers me so much that they've even gotten the support, especially Trump, that Trump has even gotten the support that he's gotten so far. So I would like to still have hope for humanity that um, that will kind of die out just as questions get asked. But I, I just don't even know what to tell you on that. Bill, let's go to you. This is if you if you look at the polling, this is kind of rapidly becoming a four-person race, at least as far as we can tell it right now, between uh, Carson, Trump, uh, Rubio, and Cruz. Um, who do you think probably the next natural candidate to drop out is? Of course, we lost Bobby Jindal from the race this week. Uh, may his memory rest in peace. But uh, my favorite candidate once again doesn't even make it to oh, Iowa. Uh, but um, what, what, who did you, who would you think would be the next person to drop out? And by the time we get to Iowa, how many candidates still officially fielding campaigns do you think that we'll have? I think we'll have seven going into Iowa. I don't see Jeb dropping out before Iowa. I don't. I actually don't see Christie uh, dropping out before Iowa. Uh, so I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's either gonna be Gilmore, Pataki out next. Um, or have they dropped out yet? I, no, I don't somebody who's on the big stage. That is somebody who people actually know is running for president, not Lindsey Graham. So, so one thing is, if you asked me, uh, you know, two, three weeks ago, I actually would have said Rand Paul. Uh, the only thing that makes me think that he is less likely to drop out is the fact that um, Blevins won the. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking of Jerry Blevins, the fantastic Mets relief pitcher who broke his arm this season. Um, uh, Bevins winning Kentucky and the fact that Rand's big challenger also got knocked out, I think he, if he had a race to worry about back home, I think he would have dropped out uh, in the next month. The fact that he doesn't have that race going anymore and his seat is pretty much secure means I think he could hang on for another month. Um, who, who else is in it? Huckabee is still in it. I, I think Huckabee will... Uh, Huckabee sell books to start with, I think. Yeah. Well, Kasich. Uh, Huckabee will... Uh, no, Kasich is not going to drop out. He's too big an asshole. So uh, those Kasich four... Kasich hates us all too much to drop out. Yeah, he's, exactly. he's at this point it'll going be, solely be, on the strength of spite. So, so Iowa, it'll be those four, Kasich, Jeb, because um, Kasich, Kasich and Jeb are both going to hold out to New Hampshire. And then uh, Christie, and who I also think is going to hold out to New Hampshire as well. So I think it's those seven. I think Huckabee drops out. I think Santorum will drop. Uh, will run out of money. I think Rand will run out of money before the primary. And um, so in terms of in what chronological order they're going to drop out in, I have no idea. But those would be the seven people I think will be on the ballot. Jeff, I something he's gonna he's gonna chip in here. I think Rand, from well, what I can tell, is the most out of money of all of them. He's he's very deep in debt, and he he, he may actually be the next one to go. In spite of kind of uh, well, he fired up his base in that last debate. We'll see how it plays in the general. Jeff, what you got for us? Uh, the simple fact is is that none of the candidates, uh, because of the way that primaries are currently run, are going to drop out until after New Hampshire. Iowa is now sort of a race that people discount. It's saying Iowa throws up losers, people 
They fucking gave us Rick Santora last time, for God's sake, and that's all you need to know about Iowa. So it's only going to be after New Hampshire that any of the main stage candidates leave, and of course... The lower stage candidates have no reason. Wait, wait, to wait, wait. Out. You don't think you don't think that if Huckabee and Santorum come in, respectively seventh and eighth in Iowa, they drop out before New Hampshire? Uh, it's possible, but I don't really think that it's. Remember, New Hampshire comes a week after Iowa. Why would they waste? Why would they bother? They might as well just wait, you know, and then drop out after New Hampshire. You know, I mean, if you're not gonna, these people didn't have any kind of ground operation that was seriously invested in New Hampshire in the first place, so they're not sacrificing one thing anyways. They might as well stay in. Now, if you, what, if they, if they think they have an endorsement of any value to give to somebody between Iowa and New Hampshire, then they might drop out. But these people don't. They have no value. They have, they have no voting in New Hampshire particularly. They got nothing to give to anybody. So why the hell would they bother to do They have no value in terms of, you know, a transactional endorsement that they can give. So that's why I don't really think they're going to do it until after New Hampshire. Well, the obvious reason, I guess, would be would be money, uh, as opposed to other things, which is the same reason that we saw, you know, Scott Walker, and I, I think it'll probably be the reason that we see Rand Paul probably be the next person. Yeah, but but, the, but Santorum and Huckabee aren't paying anybody in the first place. That's true. Which is which is the difference they have between them and Rand Paul? I mean, to me, Huckabee and Santorum are running the kind of Santorum a little less. I mean, Santorum is re- raising so little money that. I'll, as with Bobby Jindal, there comes a point even if you're only paying three people, you can't afford to continue paying those three people and your travel expenses. Uh, but I think Huckabee will stay in at least until after Iowa. But after that, I don't see a persuasive reason for him to stay in through New Hampshire. Um, so, uh, Kira, let's talk a little bit about uh, general election prospects. Um, you know, it, it's it's becoming in, increasingly clear. And you know, uh, Sarah, you can jump in on this. I know you had a, a post earlier this week. Um, there's been a lot of polling done in swing states. There was one done in Colorado earlier this week uh, by a Q poll, which showed Hillary losing by to literally all the candidates by double digits. Uh, there have been others who have that have shown her losing fairly comfortably to you know uh, Rubio and Carson in swing states like o- Ohio and so on and so forth. Less so, or even winning against Trump or Cruz. Um, how would you, if you had to, to, to guess, including gaming the Republican field, how would you uh, rate her chances right now of winning the presidency when all is said and done? Because I think that Biden dropping out has given her the Democratic nomination. I don't think there's any reason to oh, yeah. be talking about that. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. She's got the Democrat nomination unless another Barack Obama comes along, which I don't foresee ever coming along, you know, God help us. But I do believe that she is wholly and entirely beatable, and I've been rooting for her to be our candidate for years. And all of these people who are like, oh, we don't want Hillary Clinton. No, we want Hillary Clinton. She's the worst ever. So I, we want her more than we want an Elizabeth Warren or a Joe Biden. Joe Biden not running was a gift to the Republicans. So, And also the other thing that people forget and we forgot in 2012, quite frankly, is that politics is cyclical. And it is the Republicans' turn, cyclically speaking. I understand that there are anomalies, and Barack Obama was certainly one of them. And he came and he turned our election system on its head. And so I don't discount the fact, or I don't discount the chances of something you know coming out of the blue that we don't expect. That's kind of the fun thing about politics and I think why all of us on this podcast today are in politics. We we like that idea of the unexpected. But what I do believe is that Hillary is wholly and entirely beatable. People are sick of the legacy politics and they're sick of seeing her face. She had her chance. She didn't do it. And I really do believe a lot of my liberal friends are going to stay home if she has the nomination, and that's just as good as a vote for a Republican. So regardless, I, I really do believe that we would have to do truly horrible to lose to Hillary and truly horrible to – I even think Trump can win against Hillary. I swear to God I do. Um, I think truly horrible would be like Santorum or Kasich. Or, you know, but those people really don't have a chance. So I think that whoever the nominee is, and it could be, we might really see a Rubio, which I could live with. Um, I think he's a great split between the establishment and the conservative base, but I could live with almost everyone. I can't live with Hillary. 
I sure as heck can't live with Obama anymore. Um, and Trump, you know, I would like to not live with, but as we said earlier, I'd live with him over Kasich. So <laughs> I think that it, when we when it comes to the generals, we're going to see what America really feels. And honestly, I truly believe that America is tired of the last eight years, even in my own community, you know, most of my family is black, and when I have conver and they're liberals, and when I have conversations with them, although they won't say it publicly, they're tired of Obama, and they don't like what's happened, and they're really disappointed, and they feel dejected and rejected, and that's how they feel about the Clintons. They love the Clinton. Remember when Bill was like the first black president? They, my whole family used to love Bill Clinton, but now the Clintons they see as betrayers, and that's kind of how they look at Obama. And I think that there's a whole undercurrent in this country that the conservative media and the right media hasn't tapped into yet and that current to me says that our next president will be a Republican. Sarah? Uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I I tend to agree with what Kira said. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that whoever we have um, is going to be able, the only one that scares me is Trump. Um, but I think, uh, aside from that, I mean, anyone else you get against him, I mean, against her is, you know, I mean, she's, I think she's going to dig herself into a hole. Um, so, I mean, you have a poll that came out in Colorado. It's, you know, you can't read too much into it, but it's, it's a welcome sign for sure. And we have breaking news as we close out the podcast tonight. I've just been forwarded, apparently. It was just covered on Rachel Maddow. Donald Trump was asked, if he would implement a database system requiring Muslims to register and be tracked in the United States, he said yes. Also open to warrantless searches and wiretapping of mosques without court intervention, a bunch of other things. Oh, well, Leon, did you, did, you, did, you, did you hear my idea about this? I said that, that, that somebody, the next reporter who talks to Donald Trump needs to pitch him on the idea of tagging Muslims the way they do like criminals on parole or like rare and endangered birds, like putting those little tags on their ankles and then sending them back out into the wild. And I'll bet you Donald Trump will endorse it. You, you know what's really sad about that? Every mosque in the country could be wiretapped, and Donald Trump has like showed his hand, and mosques would still have higher attendance rates than Episcopalian churches. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. I'm all, all about guys. sectarian gonna... violence. It's me. That's a whole other discussion for a whole other show. That's a good point and something that's super deep. <laughs> but they're, hey, but their buildings are, are beautiful and majestic, Bill. All right, we're going to close up the uh, show tonight. I want to thank uh, my panelists for being with me. Uh, thank you, F. Bill McMorris of the Washington Free Beacon, Jeff Blair of the Ace and Space Decision Desk. Glad you guys have been uh, with us. Uh, thank you, Sarah, uh, for filling in for Neil Doing. Uh, and thank you, Kira D Davis, for being a guest. Uh, we're going to have also... This week on Red State, we're going to have the Ace of Spades Decision Desk is going to have a live stream of the elections. Jeff, what's going on with that? Do you know? Do you have any idea? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we're going to have me, Brandon Finnegan, uh, Brent Cochran, and uh, a Democrat of all people, J. Miles Coleman, Andrea Ruth. We're all going to be coming in to cover the Louisiana governor's race, which could be a blowout for the Democrat. It could be a barn burner. It could be a win for the Republican. Who the hell knows right now? So it's going to be an exciting night on Saturday. I advise everyone to tune in. So you can uh, find that live. We'll be streaming it at Red State. Just pull up. This. When, when is it going to start? I believe it's going to start at uh, uh, 8.45 Eastern Time. Is it, well, so, not, so 8.45 to 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Roll it up, Red State. You'll see the post there. Thank you, guys, the audience, for being with us as well. Appreciate you guys taking your time out of your Thursday nights. We'll be back. Not next week, because Thanksgiving, but the week after that, we'll be back again on the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Friends. <laughs>